Coogan Cassius here with Eddie Hearn. Um, yeah, we never really spoke properly um, since December 12th. Spoke for about 10 minutes after, but didn't really go into that night. Um, yeah, great night. First of all, um, I know obviously you don't officially release uh, pay-per-view figures to the public and it's all kept very much in-house between yourselves and Sky, etc. But um, Dan Raphael did tweet the other day and say that um, from his source it, it done over 400,000 pay-per-view buys. Can you make any comment on that? Um, you're right. We don't give official numbers out, but it's not very often I agree with old our friend Dan Raphael, but uh, on this instance, he, he, for once, he was very much correct. Very successful night. And uh, you know, a great sign uh, for the development and growth of Anthony Joshua. And great sign that People believed in the night. People believed in the product, and it was a huge, a huge success. And it delivered. You know, I think you know, people talk about pay per views. There's been four pay per views this year: Mayweather Pacquiao, which although it wasn't the greatest fight in the world, was the biggest fight probably ever in world boxing. May the 30th for All Britannia was just a wonderful night of boxing. Tyson Fury winning the world heavyweight title again, not the greatest fight, but a brilliant performance, and no one moaned. And then finish it off with December 12th. With not one complaint. And, and a, probably the, the best night of boxing I can remember, December 12th. So all in all, on the pay-per-view discussion, hopefully people are pleased. And uh, it's been a very, very successful year. Obviously, two of those pay-per-views were, were yours, shall we say, in Royal Britannia and also uh, Bad Intentions card. Um, I think what we've found is with uh, after... Royal Britannia after bad intentions. You say you just said it there. You're not going to have many complaints. So, but prior to that, are you having to convince people to trust you about your judgment regarding the pay per view? Why can't they be buying uh, a product that they're not sort of relying on just what you're saying? That you will have a good night. It will be worth it. So find a cross between the two. Yeah, I think we've been unlucky as well. You know. May the 30th was already scheduled, you know, sort of many weeks before. And obviously Pacquiao Mayweather came up on May the 2nd, was it? Or what, yeah. So we were left with an event that was already scheduled and already planned four weeks after. And then on December the 12th, which was another one that was scheduled weeks, you know, before the, uh, the date, all of a sudden Klitschko Fury gets moved two weeks before. So we were really up against it. And the figures that we produced, obviously, December 12th was much higher numbers, pay-per-view numbers than May the 30th, which was still very good. Um, we've done really well. And, you know, I think there hasn't really been any massive British super fights this year. I think there's been a lot of great shows, not just from us, by the way, but from other, other promoters. But next year we kick off February 27th with a British super fight, which is Frampton Quick. Obviously, you're not going to have complaints about you know, that, that fight. Um, I guess it's, you know, you've got Fury Klitschko, which was a really big fight for the world heavyweight title with no undercard. And then you've got Joshua with, with a great undercard that ends up being, you know, just full of wonderful fights. So value for money, bang for your buck. What, which one did you, I mean, the, the pay-per-view buys were very similar between the two. You know, one was a fight for the world heavyweight title, one was a British heavyweight title fight. So, you know, but, um, I, agree, I agree with what you're saying, though. You know, it, it, it'll be nice to do a pay-per-view fight without people saying, are you sure about this? And why is this on pay-per-view? You know, and I think Frampton Quigg will be one. Hopefully, the next Joshua one will be a big enough fight with people to say the same. And then the summer fight, whether it's Brooke Khan or whoever, you know, June or July or, you know, will be the same thing. But... Um, I've needed to move forward with this model in order to make sure these fighters are in big fights, keep the stable involved in big fights and try and raise the profile of British boxing. Um, so I think next year you'll see a different kind of model, personally. Um, less sort of, like I say, having to rely on these stack cards where you're convincing people it's going to be a great night. And I was right for May the 30th, December 12th. But what's interesting is that May, uh, May the 30th, was it? You had three world title fights on there. 
Like I said, Mitchell and Lara's uh, Selby Kradovic and also right. Brooke and, and Gavin. Um, it done considerably less mm. pay-per-view buys than your card on December the 12th, which had no world title fight. So what, what is that telling you? Is that telling you that's purely down to the appeal of um, Anthony Joshua, Chris Eubank, and, you know, from a casual point of view? What, why is that then? Because you didn't have any uh, world title fights, and that was probably one of the biggest yeah. things that people were saying about the card before that had no world title fights on it. I think that's another good question, and I'll give you a pair of tickets for that. Um, I think December 12th captivated, and again, I'm sorry, people, the casual market, okay? So, and the, the main two words that are responsible for the amount of buyers that that, buy, that card delivered is Anthony Joshua. This man is a phenomenon in terms of numbers. We see it all the time. And when we go on sale for his April the 9th show, it will sell out in an hour. Okay, this guy is huge. So that's the first thing. Dylan White played a fantastic role in and out of the ring. People like bad blood. People like the energy. Bellew Cleverly was another example. That did huge numbers because of the bad blood, because of the grudge match. And, and Brooke Gavin didn't really have that. You know, and that card was a purist's card more than anything. Mitchell Linares, Selby Gradovich. Ryder against Blackwell. You know, can't remember the other part, but you know. Cardall, Evan. Yeah, but a lot of. Was it who, Cardall or who? Evan. But a lot of 50 50 Hibbert against Ryan, you know, a lot of sort of 50 50 trade fights. On December the 12th, I could have told, you know, you, you present those two in a paper, on a piece of paper and tell me which one's going to do more buys. It's easy to know as a promoter, you know. Um, but it ended up being more entertaining than May the 30th, which was a great card as well. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, on the whole, December 12th, Joshua against Dylan White. I mean, it was nearly over in the first round, which wouldn't have been great for us. But then what happened after that was, one, the Royal Rumble at the end of the first round, which was just one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. And then Joshua getting tagged and caught you know, looking as though, oh, he might be a little bit vulnerable, finding his way back in the fight and then delivering a huge knockout. It was probably one of the fights of the year. And in terms of energy, you were there. You know, it was something very, very special. You know, even the Mitchell Barroso fight, you know, obviously disappointing for us. Bellew was in a war against Masternak. Campbell lost. Um... Eubank was sensational to show the performance. It was a big, big night for British boxing, but I guess it's difficult because you have to... And, and this is something I was thinking, I think this morning or last night, I was going to talk to you about. You know when you say, is a card pay-per-view worthy? Right? That's individual opinion, isn't it? I mean, there can be more people than not particularly in the boxing fraternity, that feel like it is a pay-per-view. But when I turn around and deliver, or oh, Joshua delivers those kind of numbers, do you then turn around and say, well, it is pay-per-view, or, or it has to be pay-per-view worthy? I was thinking about this. I think I was in the bath. And I was sort of thinking, do you, do you know what I mean, though? Yeah. Like, you. T so someone tells me it's not pay-per-view worthy, yet it nearly does as many buys as Klitschko Fury. So... Is it then, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but should, should a pay-per-view card be headlined by a British and Commonwealth title fight? If it's a fight that's going to do the numbers that it's done, yes. Does that not make sense? I mean... Yes, yes and I, no, but... I don't know. I mean... Because when you're selling Royal Britannia, you're selling off the back of, look, we've got three world title fights yeah, on this. Everything's, everything's it was d different products. You know, when you're selling something, you don't sell everything the same. You know, this appeals to these people. And that's why I always knew May the 30th would be solid numbers, but it wouldn't be blow your mind numbers like December 12th. So, therefore, how can, how can I, as a promoter, or Sky as a broadcaster, or, you know, look at December 12th and say, it's not pay-per-view, when it does more numbers than Froch Kessler, 
Frotch Graves won, you know, some hay fights. Like, so does that, I don't know. That's just what I was thinking. Interested to hear people's views, you know. Like, I understand what you're saying. Oh, no, a pay-per-view fight. So, you know, say Frampton Quigg doesn't do the amount of buys that Joshua Dillon White did. And if it did, I'd be really happy. But it might not, right? But yet not one person moaned about that being pay-per-view. So, I don't know. But some people, the hardcore, the hardcore market, would uh, argue that the card is being obviously if the majority of people are, uh, that are buying this pay per view on December twelfth are casual market. Do they know what they're actually buying? Of course they know. You can't. Yeah, you know, that's very offensive to the casual fan. I mean, these these people they're not like don't walk around just like. Zombies, like, just be where do I buy the pay-per-view? Everybody has a choice. But it, this goes back to, I have to target the mass market. And I always try and make sure that I deliver for hardcore boxing fans. I know I'm not the most popular geezer in the world to hardcore boxing fans. But I've got to do what's right for the business and for the fighters. And the reason that you are seeing three, four, five times the gate receipts and the live crowd that you're seeing at other promoters' events is because we are appealing to the mass market. Okay? You have to ask yourself, going back to uh, Lee Saunders, I am pretty confident they didn't sell 4,000 tickets. Could have been actually a bit, quite a bit less. But if that was me, Matram, Sky, promoting that fight and not looking for any Blue Peters badges, how many would I have had in that arena? 12? 15? Sold out? We're hitting a different audience. People are turning up to boxing events now for a night out, dressed up for the night's entertainment. Women. The profile of the audience is changing. And that's the difference. When you come to a matchroom show, when you come to a Sky Sports show, and I can understand that if you're a hardcore boxing nut, you look, what are they doing? Going to, you know, they're coming for a night's entertainment. It's only the same as we have the same thing in darts, right? The hardcore darts fans can't stand it. They'd rather we were back in the circus tavern in front of 500 people. But we're not. We're selling out stadiums all over the country for Premier League darts. You can't get in the World Championships. And the prize money is £300,000 to the winner of the World Darts Championship this year. It used to be about 10 grand. But we're appealing to the mass market. If we just appeal to those hardcore darts fans, we'll be stuck in Circus Tavern. The sport will be dead. But I understand, you know, these hardcore darts fans that turn around and we say, they say, it's ridiculous. All you can hear is drunk people singing songs and they're not even watching the darts. No, but they're enjoying themselves. They are watching the darts, just in between, down in pints. But it's it's entertainment. It's giving people value for money. It's putting a smile on people's face. And that's what we do at boxing shows. If I just built trade cards and just appealed to the hardcore boxing fans, we wouldn't be a fifth, sixth of how successful we are. And the sport wouldn't be where it was. You know, And love me or hate me, and the majority hate me, but that's okay. We've changed the sport and it wouldn't be as big as it was today if we didn't have the vision that we have and if we didn't try and break ground and appeal to a different market. So I'm sorry for the people who, you know, and I, I read, you know, the other day we did a video. I read the comments on the YouTube thing. I don't really read them. Don't ever read the comments. Oh, I mean, don't ever read them. I don't get easily offended. But that's okay. I understand that because if you're a hardcore boxing fan, you look and like people will tweet me going, Wow, great show. That was the best show. Like, that was the best night of sporting entertainment I've ever witnessed. And people are like following my timelines and then tweeting those people going, Are you a moron? I mean, what are you? Doing? And the bloke's going, Mate, easy. I just paid my money for the ticket. I had a brilliant night. That's what I'm saying. Oh, Hearn's terrible. What, you know, but in their head, I'm the root of all evil. But look at where the game is. 
you know, and I don't take I don't take full credit, just the majority. I'm only joking. <laughs> but are, th are those people who are writing those things? Are they looking at your card and are they seeing it because they uh, believe to be more hardcore than the casual? They're looking at the card, saying, "Well, actually, that's not competitive. That's not competitive. That's not competitive." Are they, is that what they're doing? Uh, perhaps I just think you know, a lot of the time it's just moaning for the sake of it. That's what I, I actually believe. But a lot of the time they see a fight that is a uh, you know. Uh, Guys are 20 to 1 on shot, which I think Campbell was 20 or 30 to 1 on. And I'm not saying that every outsider like Mendy's going to go and win the fight. But, you know, sometimes you're not going to have 50-50 fights. And this thing, showcase fights. Sometimes you're going to get showcase fights. It's not just me that does it. You know, it's it's a lot of, you know, and I think that they're going to be focusing on those more. But they're also looking to pick up anything they can. Any negatives, you know. So... But I can't base my business on a niche, say niche market, but a niche proportion of the market. Because if I did, I'd be in the same kind of shape as a lot of other promoters. And I don't even think they're trying to target hardcore boxing fans. I just think they haven't got the ability to sell like we do. And they certainly haven't got the platform. And, you know, you're not... Without a broadcaster, you've got no chance in this game. And that's why we're as successful as we are. It's not because I'm, you know, Paul Daniels. It's because, um, is he Paul Daniels all right? He ain't been done, you know. He's, he's, let me just Google Paul Daniels. He's all right, he's all right. He's, he's all safe, right. yeah. He's, he's not, he ain't got any, any trouble. No, he's not. He's still with Debbie McGee, yeah, so. That's good to hear. Good, I like a lovely couple. But it's because I've got a great broadcaster. Oh, I can sell. And I think I'm a good promoter. But without Sky, I wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't be where we were. So, I can't remember what the question was now. But basically, um, December 12th, yeah. So, it was a great fight. Joshua had to come for a real sticky spell in the second round. He was fighting off nervous energy. So he was fighting off emotion, which is sometimes the worst thing you can do. Um, but he showed a lot in that fight, showed a great chin, showed the ability to carry power in the seventh round. And by the way, Dylan White is a very, very good fighter. And I think people kind of overlooked that in the build-up. You know, no one was talking about how good White could be. They already thought they knew how good he was. Does that make sense? And I think what Dylan White showed is he's a, he's a he can be a contender at world level. I believe that. But a huge night for Joshua, learning. Hey, you, um, I spoke to you about this. I think after the press conference, where were you still interested in possibly working with Dylan White moving forward? Yeah, I, I spoke to Dylan after the fight, and he'd done a great job, you know. And I think, I guess you're gonna, you know, in the build-up to that fight, where you know I'm an Anthony Joshua man, I am the enemy, you know. But again, Dylan was treated with respect. I'm sure he agrees with that. He had a huge payday himself as well. Good luck to him. He was fantastic in the ring. He sold the fight really well. Um, you know what you're going to get from him. And I think there's big fights for him in the heavyweight division. I'd love to see Dylan White against Chisora. I really would. I think that's a brilliant fight. And, and you know, who knows if that fight can be made. But, you know, I sort of said to him, look, he's had his shoulder up. Have a couple of weeks and we'll have a catch up and, and see what's what. You know, don't rule out Joshua against Dylan White down the line too maybe even for a world title because if Dylan goes away and keeps winning people would want to see that again unless I'm wrong but I, I think that was a good fight Moving forward for uh, Anthony Joshua so the options I mean we've heard since he won on Saturday or last before week Chisora uh, possible European title shot and then you're chasing possibly Glaskov Martin? Yeah, I think Glaskov Martin probably one might work in for the summer. I don't know. Um, I think I'd like Hellenius for the European title. He's coming off a good win. Um, European champ. I'd like him to go the traditional route, Commonwealth, British, uh, European. Uh, a few other fights. You know, I quite like the, the Johan Dufus fight. You know, He gave Wilder a really good fight. Chisora fight. I don't know. 
I don't know. I'm not sure that's the one for April the 9th. Why are you looking at me like that for? I'd like to see that. Okay. I'd like to see uh, Joshua Chisora. Okay. Let me know. I'm not going to say you're a don if you make that fight, because I think you can make that fight, but um, we'll have to see. So, with regards to that April 9th show, um, Joshua will headline... We don't know, obviously, you, we don't know the situation with Eubank at the moment, but you're, you're starting to put that card together now. Yeah, I mean, I'm starting to put all the cards together. You know, obviously, January 30th, we're out with Groves, Ryder, Kamitsky, Hibbert against uh, Tommy Martin, Waldy, O'Hara, Davis, etc. And then looking at possibly February 20th for Brook. There's quite a lot going on at the moment. So a week before Frampton? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should know this week. Um, and then... Frampton, February 27th. March could be in Birmingham. Uh, and then we'll be in Liverpool on April the 2nd for a really big card. Really big card. And then April 9th will be the O2. Uh, we'll be in Leeds at some point as well, end of March or mid-April. Josh has just had a little bit of work done to his arm. Um, and then that's where we're up to, really. Probably April, crawler, end of April. Probably mid middle end of April. Just want to ask your opinion on uh, a couple of things that happened on the weekend. First of all, we've got a new British world champion in uh, Billy Joe Saunders uh, defeating Andy Lee. Uh, what did you make of that? I've watched it. Watched the fight. I was at the darts on Saturday, so people were telling me I had to tune in and I was out. But I have caught up with the fight, and it was a strange fight, wasn't it? It was very. I don't think. I mean, two good counter punches. Yeah, Andy Lee's got heavy hands and Billy Joe is a massively skilled counter, counter puncher the, 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 the knockdown surprised me in the third round um, but other than that nothing really happened in the fight a lot of close rounds I think Andy nicked like the last three because nothing was really happening um, but no it's in credit to Billy Joe I thought Andy Lee would win the fight that's what I thought but I thought Billy Joe boxed really really well you know um Again, didn't didn't really take many chances. I think he's quite smart, Billy Joe. You know, he said when he tried to finish him, he got caught by a shot, and he thought Korobov. You know, he he obviously felt Andy Lee's power and just decided I don't have to mix it with him. Now I know the fans would have much rather seen a better fight, but he was smart and he, he's world champ. So a defeat to oh by Mitchell Smith uh, to George Jupp. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of been a lot of talk about Mitchell Smith calling out Josh Warrington, etc. Um, what did you make of that first of all? Uh, it's a horrific loss for his career. I mean, listen, George, I haven't seen that fight, but George Jupp, you know, he's a, he's a good young fighter. But Mitchell Smith is says he can beat Lomachenko and Warrington and Selby, and you know, um, I saw his interview where he took he talked about how much weight he took off and. Um, stuff like that. But I think he's probably focused too much on trying to be something different or trying to be outspoken. And sometimes when you're trying to be some, something that you're not, it can take a lot of energy out of you. Do you know what I mean? Because I think as you get older, you kind of realise that by being yourself, it's a much better life. So like being a flash Harry and this and I'm going to do him you know? and he said some terrible things on Twitter to people like I've seen him you know really talk badly and disrespectfully about fighters and I've only met him a couple of times I'm sure he's a nice kid but he's going to have to take the stick that comes with it I see yesterday he tweeted saying I'm coming off Twitter <laughs> till the new year good move but listen he's he's a talent but of course he's not in the league of Warrington and even beyond that you know Lomachenko because you don't get beat at that level if you're a quality fighter forget the preparation you you know um, but you know I think it, he's controversial you know I watched one of your clips from the press conference I mean again said some terrible things but I looked at all the views from that press conference which were tiny and then you look at his ones which were big so he says things people want to, you know, not necessarily people want to hear, but he says things that create attention. So that's okay, but you've got to back it up. And when you don't, it all comes tumbling down on you. And that's what's happened to him. But he's a talented fighter. I'm sure he'll come back.
Just going back to uh, Kel Brook, um, what's the situation obviously regarding his mandatory Kevin Bizier? Um, we know obviously he was kept out of October um, and then potentially fighting towards sort of this time uh, with an injury. So what, what is an update on Kel Brook? So Kel Brook is back in full-time camp now. He's just come back from Fortaventura. He's in great shape. Um, we've been ordered by the IBF to fight Bizier. So again, it's not an ideal fight for us to be honest. But if we don't fight Bizier, we lose our belt. And we don't want to lose a belt. So we're going to get that fight done. Um, Yvonne Michelle talked about bringing that fight to Canada or America, which I'm up for. Um, I haven't had any concrete offers from them yet. And if not, I'm welcome to bring Bizier to Sheffield on February 20th to get it done. We need to clear the way for that summer fight. You know, I've sent the financials to Team Calm and spoke to one of their members at the weekend and asked for a meeting. I think they're away and back early Jan. So, of course, that remains the fight to make. But once we clear Bizier, we have the ability to, you know, make any fight we want. And again, you know, I would have liked a bigger fight. But I said before with the IBF, if you're a mandatory challenger, the IBF is the best governing body to be with. But if you're champion, sometimes it can be the toughest because they enforce their mandatories. And it's the same with Tyson. You know, going into that fight, the winner had to fight Glasgow. So as soon as the fight was over, and this is how the IBF work, as soon as the fight's over, you get that letter. You know, just to let you know, your next fight will be against Glasgow. Please start negotiating. No, oh, well, we want to fight someone else. Then you will lose your title. And we're not losing that title. So um, February the 20th for Brooke in Sheffield, or if they want to come up with the money, uh, we'll go to America. We've got, I think we've got three or four more days left on the negotiations. Then... Purse bids will be called for about 10 days' time. And, you know, listen, if someone wants to come up with a potload of money for Kel to travel, we'll, we'll do that. But um, it's not the biggest fight in the world. You did say previously, though, that a better option might for it to be in America because you yeah, sort of I, said listen, the interest levels of yeah. that here, you know, despite it being for Kel's yeah. defence of his world yeah. title. If you watch, you know, Jojo Dan beat him. It was a very close fight, but we saw what Kel did to Jojo Dan. Bizier actually, if you watch him, he's coming off a good win against Frederick Lawson. But as good a salesman as I am, it's a tough sell. But at least I'm honest. But Would you discount people for that pay-per-view? <laughs> it's not, but I can promise you now, sitting here, Brooke against Chavez is not pay-per-view. No, Bizier. Okay, uh, sorry, Brooke against Brooke Chavez. Brooke against Bizier is not pay-per-view. And, uh, you know, but we have to deal with it because we've been ordered. And, uh, you know, we have to get it out of the way. So, if we choose to fight someone else, we'll lose that title. And Do you know what, though? I will say one thing, yeah. When, like, if obviously this fight will have to happen, and when you announce it, like, you get these people on social media, like, oh, fucking busy, hey, blah, blah, blah. But it was like the Chojo Dan thing, isn't it? He has to fight him, I or I he'll. Listen, I didn't mind the Jojo Dan fight at the time. Kel was coming off uh, his injury. And Jojo Dan was the mandatory challenger. So I, I wasn't too... He just destroyed him. It was too good for that level. Um, the Frankie Gavin fight was a quick turnaround. If we had the Chavez fight in October, I wouldn't have minded the Bizier fight too much because the Chavez fight would have been a tough fight. So Bizier might be a tough fight, but from a sell, selling perspective, but we've got to deal with it. You know, so obviously if it is Brooke Chavez, it'll, uh, Brooke Bizier, it'll be a stronger card. You know, and it'll be, it'll be a big show. But I'm not, I can't sit here and say to you that the ideal scenario for us is to be fighting Kevin Bizier, because it's not. But that's our mandatory. And, you know, I can't... If I ask for an exception, which probably wouldn't be granted because of his layoff, we have to fight Bizier next in the summer. I'd rather get it done in February, and then you can have the summer fight, you know? So that's about the most honest analysis I can give you, I'm afraid. Okay, now I see what you're doing. Uh, um, regards to anyone else, uh, obviously for next year now, 2016 potentially could be top this year. I think it will. I think 2016 will be even bigger. I think you'll see more super fights in Britain next year. I think everyone's now realising the value of these mega fights. Um, Selby... 
will face his mandatory next. I think they fight on January the 16th. So he'll probably get them in March or April. Jamie McDonnell will be fighting out in America. Probably sort of... Not Comedia again. No, not not Comedia 3. Uh, February time. Gavin McDonnell also box maybe on the Brook card on February 20th if that happens. James DeGale has got a mandatory. Jose Uzcat Gui or Guy puncher from South America. Um, I'd like to see James box over here personally. Because I think if you continue to box in America, you have to kind of realise that your draw power over here diminishes every time. Does that make sense? Like coming off the back of the Durrell win, massive audience on Sky because it was at 9pm, huge profile, fights Boutte, great fight, great entertainment, but same night as Klitschko Fury and, and not watched by as many. I feel like the next one has to be in the UK or we have to base ourselves full time in the US. Because I don't think you can jump. You know, Amir tried it and it didn't work. When you come back, you're just not the draw. People forget about you quite quickly. Remember the jumbos, jumbo jets waiting to land. So, um, Is the girl Groves dead? I don't think so. No. But again, to make that the fight that it should be, I need the girl in the UK market. Do you know what I mean? Because it won't, you know, you've got, they've got to be around each other. I think, um, you know, it'd be really interested to see how uh, George Groves gets on on January the 30th. New trainer, Shane McGuigan. And, you know, I know that I don't seem to be the favourite cup of tea, but I do rate Shane McGuigan as a trainer. And I think he'll be good for George Groves. Um, a good win. You know, you've got the Callum Smith fight for him, maybe. He's stressed he wants that fight. We'd love that fight. You've got the James DeGale fight for him, maybe. You've got the Martin Murray fight. I think Groves against Martin Murray is a really good fight as well. So I think you're going to see these fights next year. I think people are going to, are ready to dive into them. Um, so that's Selby, McDonnell, DeGale, Crawler. Um, got some interesting things happening with Crawler. Learn more over the next... Couple. His next fight be against Barossa? Yeah, it could be. could be. It could be unification for the super belt. There's a super belt. Well, it would be if it was a unification fight. If you be, if you unify, you become super champ. But currently, there isn't a WBA super title, is there? But if he fought, I don't know, Flanagan or someone, or if Matthews beats him, that would effectively be for the WBO and the WBA super title. I'm not, I don't think that fight would happen, by the way, but I'm just putting it out there. You now, you've got the IBF, you've got Rancis Bartholomew, just won a world title. One last week, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, where does Ricky Burns fit into any of this lightweight action? April 9th at the O2. Ricky's up to number three now in the WBO. We want him to become the mandatory for Terry Flanagan. So, one more win, I think he'll get it. I want to push for a final eliminator on April the 9th. Zapida or Petrov. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, who else? Uh, you've got Tony Bellew. Oh, I thought it was exceptional. What is what is his next film going to be? <laughs> you know, I saw Creed the other day. I couldn't believe how good he was in it. I mean, the film is it's a good film. I wouldn't say it's, gonna, it's the greatest Rocky of all time. But Bellew was fantastic in it. And you know, I didn't realise how big he is in the film. Have you seen it? Oh, I haven't seen it. I wasn't invited to the screen. <laughs> um, no, the premiere is on January, January the 15th or something, right? But he that fight against Mastanek, people don't realise, when this film drops, Bellew's going to be a big star in the UK. And that's going to upset a few people. Right? But he didn't have to take the Mastanek fight. Like He could have just boxed someone for the Intercontinental title. But he wanted to have a proper fight. But off the back of his performance and the win, it's going to make his stop rise even higher after this film drops. So I'm going to deliver him a world title fight in 2016. Really positive. I have to. You know, I have to deliver it for him. And I think we will. Ramirez is um, an option? It is, but he's got... Well, actually, he did have a mandatory for the IBF. Gassiev and this, is it Isaiah Harris or something, Thomas, who boxed on Saturday. And it was a no contest. 
So God knows what's going to happen there. Again, it's the IBF, whatever you know. What happened in that fight? Was it a clash of heads? I think. I don't know. It's I don't a, know. But it was a it was a no contest or technical draw. <clears throat> so that's Tony Campbell is going to bounce back in a big fight. Really disappointing on December twelfth. Um, you know, I expected him to come through a tough fighting style. He didn't, and he's got to bounce back, and he will. Mitchell will sit down and have a chat. I told him to have a rest. You know, and we'll see how he feels in the new year. Um, Matthew Macklin I like the Macklin Rose fight could try and make that one for sort of March April time uh, Martin Murray against Paul Smith is a real uh, possibility um, I like that fight actually fight. really good fight Callum Smith uh, he's been mandated for the European title against Adila Muhammadi the champion could also be a final eliminator for the WBC Stephen Smith we're waiting on the date for him he's Terms are agreed for Pedraza. Looks like the second week in March for that in New York for the IBF world title. Cal Yafai will defend his British. Gamal Yafai is going to fight for the Commonwealth against Bobby Jenkinson, which is a really good fight. Would beat Louis Petit. Um, yeah, you know, I always forget someone. And Peter. Cardle. Yeah, Cardle's going to rematch Dodds on the Liverpool card on April the second. Um, uh, Martin Ward. Um, He'll be on the January the 30th card. Um, so will um, Reese Bellotti, Ted Cheeseman. Jake, no, Jake will be out in February. Um, Scott Fitzgerald will make his debut probably on the Frampton Quick card. What happened? Yeah, he broke his thumb. Oh, we had the, what? <laughs> I forgot. I forgot about it. I went to that press conference. Well, completely well, forgot next, what happened to Scott next Fitzgerald. day, after the press conference to announce him, he broke his thumb. Oh. So he's only just started punching again. So, nightmare. Uh, Eggington will fight Skeet next for the British. Husbands? Yeah, probably. Probably. Um, it's a good fight, I think. It's an interesting fight. Um, Charlie Edwards will fight Luke Wilton in the final eliminator. Probably try and make Selby Edwards at some point in 2016. Um... Gavin McDonald will probably fight on Brook February 20th if that, that's done. Josh Warrington's just had a little scrape up surgery. He'll be back end of March. Then want to make the Selby fight in the summer. Um, Rocky Fielding will return on the Liverpool card on April the 2nd. Uh, probably forgot someone and they'll, they'll moan. But. Um, well, they won't. Someone on their behalf. So you, you haven't mentioned them. What's the biggest fight potentially you could make next year? Is it Brooke Khan? Yeah. Brooke Khan or Joshua Fury? Just give me a percentage of Brooke Khan, first of all. 60 40, yes, it'll be made. He's got to get past Busy A first, though. I think Amir's going to fight. He's, he's going to have to fight. He would never go into the Brook fight straight off the bat. It'd be a year since he's boxed. But I don't know. I don't know how hungry Amir is to box again. Do you know, like I just, I don't know. He's had a really good career. He's you know he's obviously been in big fights, earned good money. What's the hunger? You know, is it just about protecting that career now and that legacy, or is it about putting it all on the line against Kell Brook? Could he walk around? after losing to Brooke might not it's a good fight 50-50 fight it'd be an absolute crime if that fight oh, was to happen so not to happen before these two eventually retired I know I can't so now we've got no Pacquiao no Mayweather for, for Khan this is it this is you know alright well it's been a long day Congratulations on your year. Massive views. How many views did you have around the Fury fight? Six million? Yeah, about six million. But, funny enough, with Joshua, White mid five. So it wasn't too far off that. And that was just a domestic card with a British title fight, really. Yeah, listen, I told you, Anthony Joshua is a phenomenon. He's just numbers like you've never seen. So... He's got to keep winning. He learned so much from December 12th. So much. Um, he'll win a world title in 2016. For sure. And uh, 
it's going to be a, it's going to be a great journey. Thank you to all the fans that have, that have turned up, watched our shows, bought tickets, bought the pay per views. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you had value for money. And I know that there's a lot of angry people out there, but just always try and remember where British boxing is now compared to where it was and, and how big, how successful the shows are, the fighters are. It's a wonderful time for boxing. And the great, you know, also stuff like, you know, Warren and Hennessy, all these little bits of needle. It's great news for fans because all we're trying to do is outdo each other. You know, you've got me who's trying to stay top of the pile. You've got Warren who would love to get back at a young kid. And you've got Hennessy now got the world heavyweight champion can he put a couple of big shows together you know it's a really interesting dynamic got loads of other promoters who would love to see me done and dusted it's great but that's what gets these these businessmen pumped for it you know <laughs> this is why I had to sit away from the camera <laughs> this is why I had to sit How away from the camera people would love to see me finished oh mate it would make all their Christmases at once but I thought you was going to say how many people would love to be where I am right now of course, no, that's given. But, you know. Oh, I'm so glad I sat there. Well, maybe not. Would like to be me, but would like to have my contract. That's probably better. But I'm, I'm relaxed. I love the competition. But yet no one's putting on shows like us. You know, just watch. Look at the arenas. You know, we're filling major arenas all the time. We're taking chances. And we're delivering. And uh, I'm not mocking what other promoters have done. I think, I think, like Frank Warren, for example, his shows are much, much better than they were. Look at Saturday night. Really, really good show. But again, sold less than 4,000 tickets. Levels. How much would you love to have the unified heavyweight world champion at Metro? I will do in probably about 12 months. But, but listen, I'm not... I don't... I'm not... Again, boxing's are full of bitter people, right? I don't sit there and go, damn it, I can't believe he's won the world. I, I like Tyson Fury. I think he's great for the game. You know, I'm not going to start going on news night and debating about what, whether he says he's right or wrong. I don't care what he says. He says that probably most of the time for attention and because he's smart, he knows what he's doing. You know, but he ain't bothered about being liked or loved. He just wants to be in the paper every day making sure he's as big as he can you know that you know but uh, if you go out there and achieve it you deserve everything you, you get so I'm never one to go damn it I hope he loses well I'll just look at it and go good luck son if you're good enough go and bring home the bacon and that applies to anyone with me or not so you think you're just misunderstood really me misunderstood no because you don't know you, don't, you know I'm not like that no, I, know, I know you're not like that but I've spent a lot of time with you but I know like some of them, some of the other promoters, they like, can't stand you. They literally, I <laughs> know, they can't stand you. Also, they've never met me, and they've never that like Mick and Frank. I've never said. Uh, I've said hello to Mick Hennessy, and I'm not even sure. I think I might have said hello once to Frank Warren. That's it. And probably if I was them, and I've been in the game a long time, and this little fat kid comes along, and starts ripping up the scene and signing fighters and doing exclusive deals with Sky for six years, I'd hate me too. Well, if you listen to the fat kid talking about how yeah. he's done them things, then you oh, probably... Oh, yeah, I don't blame Warren and Hennessy for hating me. I would hate me too. I would think, that little rich kid, horrible, silver spoon, arrogant. But most of the time, I'm just playing the game. And two, I'm doing my job. And three, I'm running a, I'm running a business that's very important to me. And like I said in our previous chat, this company is our life. It's our family. It's not like we've got a job and we're an executive and we're on a salary. So we're passionate about what we do. And we have to win. We have to win. And at the moment, we're winning. And it's not always going to be like this. We have ups and downs. And this sport, mate, I was talking to my old man yesterday about it. It's an horrible business to be in. Horrible. Just go and do the darts. Turn up everywhere you go, it's sold out. You know, you've got a bunch of players that are so happy to be there. The atmosphere is wonderful. 
You turn up, make a load of money, put on a great show. How easy is that? Boxing, it's the worst business in the world. But it's a drug. It's, you can't move, you can't get out of it. And it's, you just want to win. In and out of the ring. You just want to put on great fights. I want to fill the arenas. I want people that hate me to sit at home, turn on the TV and go, he's done it again. I can't believe it. How's he done that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm so glad I never sat next to you. I'm so glad I never sat next to you. But it's the same but, here, isn't it? You know there's people out there who can't stand you, who do the same kind of thing, right? And they look at you and they think, how's he done that? That useless, horrible, <laughs> look at him, Cassius. Started, you know, used to be a Mickey Mouse, fucking little Mike, seen his views with Klitschko Fury. But it isn't the sweet thing, delivering and sitting back, you know, with your big lardy doll on the go at Christmas going, how many views did we do this year, James? <laughs> it's right, don't it? Life's about winning. It's not, and business is about winning. It, and if you've got that winning mentality, you're always going to be all right. It's what drives you on. Uh, I do, I, I try to come across a bit less of a prick sometimes. <laughs> no, I, don't mean, I don't mean that about you, but in, I, in stuff I'm doing, I just, what, right? I don't like, a lot of time. I'm I'm not saying that I'm playing the villain, right? Because most of the time, I'm 100% me, right? But obviously, what you don't see is four hours in a car talking rub. You know, you, you might think, well, actually, in fact, I could imagine the amount of people that have gone to you, that hurt. What an absolute knob. And you've gone, do you know what? He's all right, actually. Well, I hope you have. Do you know what? I've, but they ask me about, not just you, but they'll say it to me, they'll go, like, oh, you know, what's Frank like? No, no, and, no, 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 no. About Frank Warren. And I'll, I have to say, as I find, as, as in, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I'll go, you know, I think a, what Frank's personality has come across a little bit more over the last year or so on our thing. But yeah, people do say it about you, but they have already, rather than say, what's her like, they go, I think the basic, the basic, that her is, is a, that me, Frank, and Hennessy are all right. Like, you could go for a beer with any of us and have a good laugh and a good time. We all do business in different ways. We're different people. So, but we do love the sport, and but we all want to win badly. You know, I want to keep doing what we're doing. Frank would love to be number one or he would love to get one over on me or better still for me to be finished and Mick the same you know but I don't know you know I just every day I do the same thing I get up I work as hard as I can and I do what I think's right whether that's right or wrong time will tell but it's fun it's fun you know, and I think I think boxing is much in a much better way. You know, going back to when there was four promoters on Sky, blimey, we were terrible. Matchroom. I mean, everybody else was terrible as well. But we were all terrible. It was like Friday night. Welcome to Witness Leisure Centre, where it's Ian Napper fighting for the Commonwealth title. No disrespect to Ian Napper, by the way. You know, a Commonwealth title fight against someone you've never heard of. And we're showing one other fight, and that's an eight-round contest between Joe Bloggs and... We were ter like it was, it was embarrassing what the four promoters on Sky were producing. But no one knew any different. Now, look at... You know, again, not, and it's not just me. Look at December 12th. Look at Saturday night with Warren. Two domestic world title fights. Six other championship fights. Listen, fantastic. I want other promoters to do the same. The, the sport's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But only the fittest will survive. And only the ones that have the right model and conduct business in the right way will survive over time. And I believe we're well placed for that. But anything can happen. Just like in a fight. All right. Well, listen... <laughs> Retiring from boxing. You can have my five and a half years left with Sky, and uh, me and James are going to head off to a beach. Who do I get as my partner? 
quite a few are a promoter. Little Frank Smith, who works with us. That'll do. do. Right. That'll do. You're right. But listen, anyone can do it. It doesn't don't take a lot to be a boxing promoter. You've got to stand up there and talk rubbish, haven't you? You, you said it. You could promote a fight. You could do my job. No. Why not? I was actually going to say yes. I, 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 I don't think anyone can. The sheer amount of professional promoters there are in this country is probably a testament to that. Yeah, but it's only really if you've got a broadcaster. Once you get a broadcaster, you're sweet as a nut. Just be a knob. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a knob, fill arenas, hit great numbers, and sign great fighters. But there must be something to our product. But I think the key is the... You have to be relentless. And I think that's why Frank has done really well over time. Because I think he's relentless. And I think that's one of his biggest, brightest attributes is he'd almost forget the the model and, you know, to just be relentless. Just drive forward, get them, go on, get, you know, without sometimes thinking about how much is this costing or how much money we're doing, how many tickets have we done? Because I'm more, much more methodical, probably more boring. You know, I know they always give a stick about it's quite funny the other day, I tweeted saying, well, we're just accountants after all. Because Frank always says, they're not boxing people, they're just accountants. But I tweeted that, my old man came back and said, you couldn't be less of an accountant if you tried. He's a child accountant. But he's always instilled in me to understand the numbers. I don't really make many decisions without thinking about the numbers in advance. But that's how you get longevity from business. That's how you, when you promise fighters something, that's how you deliver on the Monday you know you don't run a show and go how am I going to pay everybody what have I done here I thought this would do 15,000 it's easy done in boxing just like having a football club oh go on go on Barry go on Eddie up the O's got to buy some new players yeah Whoa, oh, centre for bomb wages turn around he's done five six million quid look at Simon Jordan at Palace same thing Made a load of money out of mobile phones. Loved Crystal Palace. Bought the club. Everyone was telling him how great he was. Simon, you are the saviour of this club. Spent his absolute conkers and went, and went skint. It's emotion. Same thing in the ring. Fight on emotion, make mistakes. Run business on emotion, make mistakes. That's why, you know, like with McGuigan, all these people, I have no feeling towards them at all. I don't... I don't look at Barry McGuigan, I don't look at Frank Warren or Mick and go, I can't stand him. Oh, he makes my blood boil. I think, competitors, any business we can do together? No? Okay. What else is happening? You know, it's just, you have to, in business, in sport, in life, you make the correct decisions by leaving emotions aside. And on that note, my friend, I bid you farewell. Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas to the IFL viewers. Another fantastic year for boxing for all of us. I hope you and your families have a wonderful Christmas. Let's be happy. Let's embrace each other in life and on social media. Eddie Hearn, thanks for talking to IFL TV and uh, we'll catch up with you in the new year. Cheers, mate.